Well, my wife, Robin, and I are so thrilled to be here with you. We had a great day yesterday, as Pastor said, and uh, made a lot of, met a lot of new brothers and sisters in Christ I didn't know that I had, and we had a great time. You folks are so friendly, and you're Michigans, Michiganders, and you're friendly. I'm from Tennessee, Robin's from West Virginia, and everybody's friendly down there. We live in Pennsylvania, and um, I think, Robin, they're a little bit friendlier here. I appreciate uh, the time to um, fellowship with those that God has given us so far. Uh, last night, we met with uh, the, the missions uh, leadership team, the church leaders, and talking around the table, and um, there were started, I started to receive some recommendations and suggestions on what I should preach on today. And so I took that in advisement, consulted with God, and thought I would just go with what God told me to, to do. I'm sorry, guys. No favorites or anything, but no, we had a lot, of, a lot of good fun. And thank you, Bob and Gloria, for hosting Robin and I these last two nights. Very refreshing, restorative place you have there. Just a peaceful place that God has given you. And thinking of places, I am really excited to experience being in your building here with you. I've, I've been tracking, I've been hearing stories. This is, this is God. This is all from God. God is greatly has his hand of blessing upon you folks here. Don't get used to this. I mean, be excited about it. Don't, don't take it for granted. God's blessing. And this is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. So as we say down south, tighten your seatbelt and hang on for the ride. Well, we, this has been a um, focus this weekend on uh, missions. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing on this morning with you. <clears throat> missions. Missions, I shared with a group yesterday, missions is not a part of your church. Some of you look a little disappointed, like, it's, this is heresy? Missions is not part of your church, guys and gals. Missions is not a program of your church. It's not even a priority of your church. Missions is the purpose of why we exist. You know the passage of Scripture well in Matthew 28, where we read there what we know of, we call the Great Commission. It's really a command that the Lord gave to his disciples, which we are his disciples if we have placed our trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone for our eternal life. It's for us today as well. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age or the end of the earth. Mark says it this way in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If you were to open up your phone and, and go to Google and Google world population clock, this morning, you will find that there are 8 billion, 20 million people plus on the face of the earth living right now. And it begs us the question, if missions is the very reason, the very purpose of our existence as God's children of making disciples, where do we fit into that great commission? that command to his disciples, go and make disciples all over the world. Eight billion, 20 million people, all creatures, needs to hear the gospel. Where do I fit in this? Where do you fit into the Great Commission? This is what I want to talk through with you this morning. And I forgot I have a PowerPoint, and we spent a lot of time making this work, so I got to use it, right, Autumn? Go with me to the book of 3 John. Then the, in, towards the end of the Bible, 
verse 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. But I want you to seriously make this, if you will, and I recommend you do this with me. Let this prayer be from you to God. God, what do you want me to do? And earnestly, sincerely from your heart, saying, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Father, I pray that as we step into your holy scriptures this morning, that you would guide and direct us, Lord, that our hearts would be open, our souls would be open and sensitive to the, to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Teach us, Holy Spirit. Convict us. Challenge us deeply. And Father, what do you want me to do as your son, as your child? And I pray that each one would be, be as earnest and saying, God, whatever you, whatever you want me to do, if, if, you, if you share something with me today and you, you, you work in my heart, my soul, God, whatever that is, I will, I will say yes to you. I will follow you. I will do that. And so, Lord, thank you for being here in our presence. We know that you're going to speak to us. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Look at the first eight verses. I want to read them to us in 3 John. There's only one chapter, and uh, there's just 15 verses here. We're just going to focus in uh, to begin our time together in these first eight verses. Follow along as I read. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may go, that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts. For these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church, you will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. <clears throat> a little bit of background to help you appreciate a little bit more this third letter that John has written to a man named Gaius. The Apostle John wrote this as I said to a man named Gaius, in part to commend him for his expressions of love toward fellow ministers of the gospel. And evidently here, some itinerant missionaries had been sent out by John's church and had now returned back to the church, and they give a report here about how well Gaius had treated them. Here, I find that there are two categories of Christians that John mentions here in verses 1 through 8. The first group is this, those whom he identifies as brethren and strangers, verse 5 and 6. I call these brothers, brethren and strangers, I call them Christian missionaries. Christian missionaries, they are the ones who go. They go and share the gospel, the hope of, is found in Jesus Christ. They leave home to carry the hope to a hopeless world. And then there is Gaius himself. Gaius here, he stands as an example, and watch my wording, order of my words here. Gaius stands and represents missionary Christians. Missionary Christians are those who send the Christian missionaries who are going. Now, it's a little brain twister, I know, and it's still maybe early for some of you, but I did that purposefully to make us think a little deeper than just listening to words. We have to think a little bit here. Christian missionaries are goers who go with the gospel to take it to those who do not have it. Missionary Christians are the goers 
who sent out in support of those whom are going with the gospel. These two categories of believers highlight for us, I believe, an important missiological axiom. And here's how it goes. Not every believer is called to be a Christian missionary, a goer. I'd like to add to that, yet. But until God calls you to be a Christian missionary, a goer, every follower of Christ must be a missionary Christian, a sender. And that's, that's, there's texts all through scriptures that back that up. You are either a goer or you are a sender, one or the other. Two things to be learned, I want to point out uh, as we go through these uh, short verses. First of all, I want us to, to learn some lessons. There, there are two things to be learned from being a goer and being a sender when it comes to the Great Commission, which is what we're to be about as God's children. So first, the Christian missionaries, they go in close relationship with the, the church with this local church. You have missionaries and they're, they're going out, but they go, missionaries don't go out on their own. They're not, there's, you, don't, you do not find in scripture the Lone Ranger principle, it's not there. And missionaries or Christian missionaries, they go in close relationship with the church. John here learned of Gaius's wonderful work through the testimony of the missionaries who were reporting back to the church in, verses, uh, in verse 6. Brings that out. And the significance of this relationship is, is made clear in Acts chapter 13, which I'm knowing your pastor, he's, he's preached here and, and, and this text and shared it with you. It's a very familiar passage. I uh, won't be there very long, but let me just mention that the significance of the relationship of the Christian missionaries, those who are going with the, with the church that is sending them, really is, is, is brought out in this text, chapter 13 and chapter 14. You know, just a little bit of uh, uh, stepping back a little bit uh, so you know the context of what's going on here. Barnabas and Saul were the first missionaries out of the Antioch church. They're the first missionaries that we know of recorded here. And the church was, had, was, was sending them out. The Holy Spirit had already called Saul and Barnabas uh, to, to, uh, as Christian missionaries, as goers. But he also calls the church in Acts 13 to, to send them. There's a twofold call there, those who are going and those who are sending. S uh, goers just don't come up with the idea and just go off on their own. No, we do it as a family. God does not call a missionary without calling their church to send them. It goes together. We're a team. We're on the same team. And why I say that Christian missionaries go in close relationship to, uh, with the church, because at the end of that missionary journey, whenever Barnabas and Saul, re they return back to church at Antioch. Chapter 14, verse uh, 26 reads this way. And from there they sailed to Antioch. So they're on their way back to Antioch. From there they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained at no little time with the disciples. Here, Barnabas of Saul, they were coming back to, give a, to, be, a, to be accountable to the church that sent them out to give a report. And so as missionary or Christian missionaries, they go in close relationship under the authority of the local church body like um, Allendale Baptist Church sending out missionaries. Um, they are accountable. Christian missionaries are accountable. Secondly, what I want to point out here about Christian missionaries, the Christian missionaries, they go for the sake of, of Christ's name in verse 7. This is exciting. In, in verse 7, we read here where it says, for they have gone out for the sake of the name. That's what John tells us is the motivation for the goer's work. They went forth for his name's sake. Why else would they go? Why else would they, would they leave um, a family and leave home and the comforts of home for the unknown? 
it just doesn't make sense. Why, what their motivation is here is they went forth in his name for the name of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus Christ. To follow Jesus means um, living your life for the sake of his name. Whether you go to Nepal or you stay right here in Allendale, you, you live for the name of Jesus Christ. This church here is, is here for the namesake of Jesus Christ. To get the word out that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves everyone. You know, Paul's whole life, I've said thus far, it's Saul and Barnabas. Saul becomes Paul. But Paul, whole life as a missionary was to live for the glory of God. When, con when, when confronted with a prospect of suffering and persecution, he declares this in Acts 21, verse 13. I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether I live or where I die, I do it for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's first. He's first and foremost. So a call to be a Christian missionary does not mean a change of passion. It just means a, simply means a change of location and circumstances in pursuing that passion, and that is God, no matter where you are. And so you as a church should only send missionaries that have shown and proven that they have a passion for the name of Jesus Christ. And then the third thing here I want to mention about Christian missionaries is they go as workers for the truth. It's in verse 8 right here. Workers for the truth. Goers, these Christian missionaries are stewards. They are messengers taking the truth to the different people groups who do not have the gospel yet. They must be diligent students of God's word to assure that the message is accurately, accurately communicated. My friends, there is, there is no place on any mission field, there's no place for doubters and skeptics. You must believe the word of God. Let me come back to our missiological axiom again. We've talked about Christian missionary goers. Not every believer is called to be a Christian missionary, that is a goer, yet. Because I'm thinking and I'm praying, God, who are you going to call from this congregation? Who's going to be the next Christian missionary coming out of Allendale Baptist Church? Maybe it's you. God, what do you want me to do? Not every believer, though, is called to be a Christian missionary. But every follower of Jesus Christ must be a missionary Christian, a sender, because you've been given, you've been, you've been put on uh, mission. You have a commission being given to you. When you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your eternal life, you became in, in on, you were placed on God's team. You're in God's family, and we've been given a purpose, and we need to share Jesus Christ. We need to go and make disciples. He instructs us. So every follower of Christ must be a missionary Christian. John encourages Gaius here to send them, that is the missionaries, forward on their journey in verse 6. So as in the case with the first missionary journey from Antioch, those who did not go sent. So let's look at the missionary Christian, those who are sending. Only two things I'm going to say about missionary Christians. And so since God has not sent, called you and sent you yet to be a missionary, I am speaking to you at this point. I'm speaking to us here in this room. We are missionary Christians. How should missionary Christians, how should Allendale Baptist Church missionary Christians send out their missionaries? Well, filled with love. Filled with love. John commends Gaius for the love. For the love which he, he had heard about from the report of others. Isn't it somewhere in scriptures we, we hear that we are, we, are, we are known by our love. I believe it's in John. Um, we should be characterized by love as missionary Christians, as children of God. And the characterization should be based upon, first of all, we, we must have love for God. Do you really love God? Love for God, a deep 
true devotion and passion for God will ensure that you, that you send your missionaries out in a manner worthy of God, as it says here in verse 6. But not just a love for God, but love for the brother. And in the context here, we're talking about missionaries. Love for those that, that, that you're sending forth. Because this kind of love, love, love for the brethren, those going out for the sake of Christ, will, will ensure and cause you to take a keen interest. And I didn't mention this, but in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, we find that there's a twofold call in that verse where the Holy Spirit says to the church, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul, that's your first call. To the work to which I have called them, that's, there's a call for, for, for Barnabas and Saul to go, and the Holy Spirit calls the church to send them. Twofold call. Mutual ministry, mutual responsibility, mutual, mutual obligation. It's your ministry, church. It's not just the missionary's ministry. It's your ministry. And we're going to be held accountable before the Father on how well we've done that. So, you know, it's not, okay, you know, we're glad you're going to be a missionary. That's wonderful. No, you're part of the team. The team needs you. We're all in this together. And um, um, we must send out these Christian missionaries with love, love for them. You won't have difficulty getting involved with them and encouraging them and praying for them and even investing in them monetarily. That, that, that's probably your role on the on the team, the, com uh, the Great Commission team. But you know, love, love is not enough. It's not enough. And by the way, we need to have a love for the people in the world too, not just love for God. I think if, we, if we're really in love with God, God gives us that love for, for people, no matter what language they speak, no matter where they live in this world. But, love, but love's not enough to be Missionary Christians that sin. Zeal for world missions is no excuse for being weak on the truth. And so the second thing I want to mention here to you is that how do we sin, church? We sin not only filled with love, but we, but we, but we sin committed ourselves to the truth. We expect those that are going out from us to be strong in the truth, but hey, we need to be strong in the truth too. Because if we're not strong in the truth, who knows what, what lie may come into our midst. And, and, and um, that's how cults are started, actually. Uh, we get a false, false teaching going on. If, we don't, if we're not students of the word, we might not be able to catch this underlying little half-truth. And, and before long, we're believing something that the word of God doesn't believe. We need to be strong in truth ourselves. So those, those who sin must be committed to God to reveal truth as those who go. John recognizes this quality here in Gaius and encourages him to become, in verse 8, a fellow worker with missionaries, fellow workers for the truth. And how do we cultivate this, church family? How do we cultivate that? Back in verse 3, it says there, by walking in the truth ourselves, spending time in God's word for ourselves. Don't just depend on the wonderful teaching and preaching that you get here when you come here. Hey, God's, God's awake every day of the week. He's given you his precious word. God speaks to us whenever we read the scriptures. And we talk back to him on the same topics. We must grow deeply in our passion, in our passion, our holiness for him. And it's going to take, it's going to take your effort to, to learn to walk in the truth as you expect Christian missionaries to be walking in the truth as you send them, send them out. So that's how you cultivate that steadfast, practical devotion to, to the truth. Love and truth make for a spiritually potent combination when you think about it. With both, it, it proves beneficial for meeting the needs of the missionary. So bottom line is this. You're either going or you're sending. There's, this isn't a spectator sport. You're either going or you're, you're sending. And by the way, if you didn't know, we have all been called to be engaged in the mission. That is the reason why we're in existence as God's children. 
we've all been called to be engaged. Let's say tomorrow your phone rings and you answer it and you learn that you have been appointed to be a foreign ambassador for the United States in some foreign country. Wow. The political clout, the prestige, and the, the um, exotic travel and all of that just kind of runs through your mind. And probably like me, I'd be, I, I would immediately be scared to death. What? Not me. I can't do that. But serving as an ambassador for your country, it's, it's a, a high privilege. It's a, it's a great honor, a distinguished honor. But it also carries an enormous responsibility, wouldn't you say? Well, listen to what Paul says. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, and I've already given away what Paul said on the screen, but you listen to this. In chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, verse 20, he says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your eternal life, friends, if you didn't know it, you know it now. You are an ambassador of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You represent the almighty God. You are an ambassador. What? And for me, I became an ambassador just as a very small child. Very, very young child. I didn't know I was an ambassador, but I knew something was different about me, even, even very young, I knew, because I believe God doesn't lie. And God told me, my parents told me, God told me this, that God doesn't lie. And he said, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so that means if I call on the Lord and admit that I'm a sinner and, and, and believe that he died for me to take care of my sin problem and confess him as Lord, and I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away. All have become new. I believe that God wouldn't lie to me. And so I prayed and asked God, said, here I am. I want to be your child. I became an ambassador right there and then. Didn't even know I was, but I was. And the same with you. If that has happened, that has happened in, in your life, you are an ambassador. What would motivate any, someone for this task of being an ambassador? Well, let's see what Paul, what motivated the Apostle Paul. He says here in this, in Second Corinthians passage, he gives us his two motives. I'll quickly point them out to you. Paul was motivated for ministry in verse 11, we find Find the first indication here. It says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Now, this fear is not the kind of fear that, that is, is terrorizing fear. That you want to run and hide, and you're scared to death, as, as the saying goes. No, this, this word here, fear, simply carries the meaning of reverence, of awe of the Holy One. A feeling of awe, basking in his holiness. Just, I mean, just that's awe right there. His holiness. And Paul says here, knowing that fear, that reverence, that awe of his holiness, it pers- it, it, I am persuaded to tell others. We pers- I must persuade people. In this truth, look at the second thing that motivated him. Same chapter, verse 14. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. Or in some of our translations says, the love of Christ compels us. I believe Christ's love for Paul, God's love for Paul, the relationship that Paul had with the Holy One caused him to to bask in that love. He was just overwhelmed by it, and he experienced the change of life that comes to having a personal relationship with a true and living God that 
the fear of God that came with that compelled him, compelled him to proclaim truth to all those he came in contact with. It was evident in his life, everywhere he went. So both the fear of God and the love of Christ that compelled him, both are necessary, I believe, for being involved in the ministry of reconciliation, which Paul talks about here in verse, down in verse 20. True devotion, that is desire, true devotion for God will compel us to share him, I believe. But then the message, what is his message? The ambassador of Jesus Christ's message? Verse 20, here it is, very simply. Be reconciled. Be reconciled to God. That's the message of an ambassador. Every ambassador has a message from the commander-in-chief. Well, ours from the King of kings and Lord of lords is be reconciled to him. Reconciliation means to restore a, a friendship, a, a harmony, if you will. It's a change from enmity to friendship. And this passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 20, this passage describes God's reconciliation that he has provided for us. God took our sins upon himself and became sin for us. Awesome. So, so we might be able to have a relationship with him. See, it was my problem, my sin problem. It wasn't his problem. It was mine. But he came to redeem me back to himself as well as, as, well as you. So verse 20 here tells us that our responsibility and message as Christ's ambassador is to plead to the people to accept God's grace, Jesus Christ, and to lay aside enmity, lay aside their sin. Now, I just want that to sink in, all that we've said so far. I, don't want, I said all that I've said to get down to this right here, kind of recalibrate, adjust our thinking, and do it in this way, and that is, Aren't you glad someone told you about Jesus Christ? Someone that was faithful in the relationship, they were faithful in obedience to the Savior to come and share with you Jesus Christ. Who was God's ambassador for you? For me, it was, it was my mom and dad. My mom and dad not only are my earthly parents, they are my spiritual parents my dad and I, he's in heaven now, six, seven years ago. For 38 years, every Saturday evening, he and I would be on the phone. We would always be reading a book together. We always asked and challenged what we were preaching the next morning. And um, that, they were my ambassadors. The ambassadors that God sent into my life at a very small, young age as a child. Who was your ambassador? Maybe it was multiple people that God used, multiple ambassadors. Right now in your heart, in your mind, just praise God for them, for their faithfulness. Where would we be without Christ right now? We don't even want to think about that. But who will go and share this message of reconciliation to the folks in Nepal? The folks in Turkey. Oh, what a devastation is going on there. It breaks your heart to see the images. Who is going to go to reach the Egyptians, the Muslims around the world or in your own neighborhood? The Hindus, the Buddhists. To whom, let's make it a little more personal, let's get closer home now. To whom is God calling you to be an ambassador to? Let's make, it, make the application here. Who in your life right now, needs God's redemptive work. Maybe it's people in your own family, people you go to school with, in the workplace. Who is it in your life that perhaps maybe God puts you where you are right now in these relationships on purpose as his ambassador? And I remind you here, in the second Corinthians chapter five, verse 10, this verse, which says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. One day, 
And this, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm, this is truth I'm giving to you. I'm not trying to manipulate you in any way. It's just God's word here. That's why I read that. But one day, you and I will stand before God, and we're going to give an account of our calling as an ambassador. That's very sobering to think about. Very convicting. Paul understood this. He understood this. Let me read some scripture here. You can follow along there. That's too small back there for me to try to read off of the off of the uh, screen in the back. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Now, if you understand the context of where he is writing this, Paul, Paul, is, Paul is in bonds. He's getting ready to offer his head to Nero's chopping block, and here he says something like this. How was he able to say this? Well, let me give you a visual. He loved that world more than he loved this world. He laid up, he has laid up more up there than he has down here. He was more popular up there than he was down here. That's how he can say this. When some of us die, we may have a hard time leaving this place because all we've laid up is right here. Think about this. What can you take to heaven with you? There's only one thing you can take to heaven with you. Someone else. That's why we're ambassadors. Let's, let's get as many as we can to go with us. That's our commission. I like, I've always liked biographies, and especially of men and women of God from the past. Dr. George Truitt is one of those men. He was a pastor at the famous First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas for 47 years, about two, two and a half generations ago. And he was known as a man who, when he would meet anyone, he would talk to them about the Lord and find out what, where they are with the Lord. Are you, do you have a relationship with the Lord? He would always share his faith. And there was one man a, ran, a wealthy rancher that he was really burdened for and, um, and, and been working with him, talking with him, he befriended him and for, for quite a while. And this wealthy rancher invited Pastor Truett out to his ranch for an evening meal. And after they finished the meal, um, well, during the meal, actually, of course, Pastor Truett was faithful to sharing Christ. And that's what he was doing. And... Uh, um, the, the wealthy rancher pushed his chair back from the table, and he says, Pastor Truett, come on out here with me. And they went out to the veranda. For you and me, that's probably a deck or front porch, but, there, but it was a veranda. The wealthy rancher took him out there, and he, this wealthy rancher pulled out a big stogie, a big cigar, put it in his mouth, lit it, took in a deep draw, and blew it out. And he said, Pastor Truett, look to the east. See all those white-faced cattle? They're all mine. And look to the west. As far as the eye can see, it's all mine. And look to the north. See all those fir trees? They're all mine. And look to the south, Pastor Truett. See those bulging silos? They're all mine. And as the story goes, Pastor Truett's said, look up. I said, look up. I don't care what you have to the east, the west, the north, or south. I only care what you have up there. Do you have anything up there? And I asked myself that question. Do I have anything up there? Or I'm just playing church down here. Am I living for myself and things? Things have their place. But if, but if it's priority over the main thing, then it's not good. What do you have up there? 
Do you have anything up there? When you come to the end of your life, will you be able to say with Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So now we're back full circle to where we started with that question. God, what do you want me to do? Remember you prayed and you told the Lord, God, whatever you tell me, I'll do it. I'll follow you. I'll be an, I'll be an obedient child. What does God want you to do? And as we close our time, I want to close with something special. I think it's special. It's a, it's a video that I want to share with you. And I'll come back after the video, just make one or two comments, and, we're, and we'll be done. But this is a story that is told in poetic language and music. Maybe that's why I like it, because I have a music background, and I love, I love music. But this is a story told in poetic language and music, and it's, it's a fictional account about a young, young filmmaker that's going across the world, capturing this world, what's going in the world, through the unblinking lens of her camera. And she sees the beauty, she sees the pain and the destruction, the hope and disappointment, and she passionately asks God, why? Why, God, is mankind in such a mess? Why has God allowed this to happen? And what in the world can be done about it? And God's answer is going to stir your heart. Watch this with us. I'll go back. I think there was a pause, and I didn't wait long enough, I don't think. Before creation, before the formation of all that is, there was you, God, yourself, perfect, complete, needing nothing. But did you look out at that empty sky with a lonesome ache for something more? Something yet to be born, unformed. Were you reaching for us? Were you reaching for me? Let it be, you said, and with that one command, it was all underway. Light and energy, gravity, synchronicity, orbits and galaxies, comets hurtling down galactic highways, a space-time ballet, a thousand years but a day, a brand new planet. Hot with the fires of creation, life under construction, cells, replication, DNA code, embedded commands of how to grow. Make yourself at home, woman and man. Walk the length of the land, scale the mountains, run the rivers, drink from the springs, let your free will wander down the pathways of this garden. Wait. Wait. Have I got this straight? We gave it all away. We traded it away in a strange transaction. The forging of the first weapons, the spilling of first blood, the trampling and trashing of paradise, blowing the gift to pieces with a bang. 
So now the need for intensive care. So now the rain for a star strip bear. So now the city give birth to slums. So now the rifles and suitcase bombs. Why, 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 why? Why is a promising life ripped away just when it gets this ride and runs free? Thanks, rattle and pound. Soldiers get cut down, never getting to say goodbye. Why? Why are kids sleeping out in the cold, spreading out their masks on the side of the road, drown in the dust, unable to trust or try with no tears left to cry? Why? How did it feel, God, when you bought this cracked shell of a planet, cried like a broken-hearted child for the perfection of what was supposed to be up against the brutality of our reality? <sighs> This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. Is in the wonders fall. How many prayers? are rising up right now. How many hopes are balanced on you? God, your ancient story says you gave up your life, your flesh, and your blood for love. And as the story goes, you're still reaching. You watch over the grieving. You capture every sigh. You measure the space between every heart. Oh, there's a promise that winds its way through every weather page. A feast for the hungry, the delivery of the captives, healing for the desolate, the final satisfaction of justice, making all things new. Hope in the clinics where the sick hold on. Hope in the schools and the holding cells. It echoes in the halls of the hospitals. Hope rises up in the cities and the war zones. Hope in the courtroom and in the broken home. In the seminaries and the cyber highways. In the alleys of the homeless and the hungry. In the shack settlements and the compounds. On the farms where the soil is hard and dry. The streets where the grieving mothers cry, where the AIDS open stare up at the start, where the captives pound on the cell wall, through the coal mines, towns, and the factories, in the ghettos, in the prisons, and the cemeteries. So where is it? I see it. Get it. The fulfillment of the promise. See it down here in the middle of the fear. What hope can remain in the depth of this fear? See it. The earth is groaning night and day. A song of human slavery, of dark disease and poverty, of children in captivity. God, that's the sound that comes to me. Are you still far away on high? Still staring out at that empty sky? Still reaching out with that longing hand? I hear no voice and I don't understand. I know about theology. I know you gave your son for me. I know you're wrapped in mystery. I get invisibility, but I still See their misery. I hear their voice come to you and say, Move for confidence. Move for confidence instead of free. Move for confidence. Here am I. Send me. Here am I. 
Sydney. Aquí estoy yo. Envíame. Andito ako. Ipadala Even mo ako. Stephen. Hi. Night on day. I sign tang day. Map page. Here I'm on. Send me a key. Yeah, <laughs> Here am I. Nandito ako. Here a sec. Here am I. Dizzy Pano. Here am I. Not off and breakfast. Give me a key. Here am I. Here am I. The world is crying. Who will come? set us free. Who will come and set us free? Who will come and set us free? God, what do you want me to do? Here am I. Send me. Father, I believe you have spoken to our hearts. There are people all around us, right where we live, right here in Allendale, that are crying out, who will come and set me free? They may not be using those words, but they are hopelessly lost. And Lord, what do you want us to do about it, your children? But to be obedient, to be obedient to the command that you've given us to go and make disciples. May we respond to you in obedience and follow you by saying, here am I, send me. Thank you, Jesus, for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Amen.